Well, years ago, blood transfusions were done where the patient would uh, be sitting, and then the one that was giving the blood, he the blood would flow from one arm uh, to the arm of the person who needed it, so now they don't do it that way. But uh, there's a story told that's a true story about uh, a young man who was going to give blood to his sister uh, so that she could have what she needed after a operation. And so uh, he was volunteering, and he was watching the blood flow from his vein to her vein, and when uh, the transfusion was over into her body, he looked up at the doctor and he said, Doc, how long is it going to be before I croak? <laughs> and uh, for some reason, he was, he was young, he didn't understand, but he thought that the blood coming out of his arm going into his sister's arm would mean his death. So he thought in order for his sister to live, he would have to die. This story, true story, illustrates the highest degree of human love. It certainly illustrates what Jesus said in the upper room. Greater love has no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friends. And then he goes on to say, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And so John is really going to reiterate what Jesus said there in the upper room regarding loving the brethren. And not only does John reiterate what he heard from his master in the upper room, but he also is going to talk about where it is written in the Old Testament, this command to love the brethren. So let's listen in as to what John has written for us in 1 John 2, 7 through 11. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, which you've heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true and in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness. He walks in darkness. He does not know where he's going because darkness has blinded his eyes. So we have an outline this morning for our lesson. We're going to look, first of all, the nature of the old commandment in verse 7, the nature of the new commandment in verse 8, the nature of those who hate their brother, verses 9 and 11, and then the nature of those who love their brother, verse 10. Now, as I mentioned, this is not the only time that John is going to write about the importance of loving our brother. And he's going to mention it several times throughout this epistle. In fact, you're going to hear it repeated numerous times, but this is the first mentioning of loving the brethren, and it's interesting because John was known as the apostle of love. Uh, Peter was known as the apostle of hope, but John is known as the apostle of love. And so before we get our lesson this morning, I think the first thing that we need to ask, uh, ask ourselves is this, is it possible for you and I to claim to be in the light, to claim to be Christians, to claim to be uh, of God, and yet at the same time hate our brother? Well, thankfully, I don't have to answer that because God will answer that through his word. Now, just a little review of where we were last time. We saw in our last lesson uh, the test of genuine believer. First of all, we saw the test of obeying his word. This is how we know we know him if we keep his commandments. And so it's not a sporadic keeping of God's commandments. It's an ongoing habitual attitude of keeping his commandments. Is it perfect? No. But a true Christian confesses their sin and they move on. And so we should be known as daughters who keep the Lord's commandments. We also saw another test, the testing of walking as Jesus walked. And we saw the walking there is tracing a pattern. I use the example of, of a sewing class, you know, where you take that tracing tool. And, and I told you my patterns turned out really weird. My aprons and things didn't turn out like the pattern is supposed to. But the idea is you trace exactly. And so we saw the test there. We walk walk as he walks. That means we do what Jesus would do. We say what Jesus would say. We think the mind of Christ. And if we're not doing those things, uh, we pray and we ask the Lord to help us and help us to start thinking and acting like he would have us to do. And so we, as we mentioned, we saw that one of the tests is obedience, obedience to his commandments. And now John is going to transition into one of those commandments that we are to be obeying. And one of those is to love the brethren. So let's look at the nature of the old commandment. 
John writes, brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. Now your translation, uh, King James says beloved, your translation might say brethren, but the actual uh, translation is beloved. And this is the first time in this epistle that John calls them beloved, which just means dear. He also will call them this in chapter three, verse two, when he says beloved, now are you the children of God. Uh, verse 21 of chapter two, beloved, if your heart condemns you, God's greater than your heart. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Uh, chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And then uh, 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. So those are the other usages where he uses the word beloved. And it just means dear, dearly loved ones. And it's interesting that he starts this section on loving the brothers with the word beloved. Um, several reasons for this possibly. Uh, not only was he known as the apostle of love, but he's getting ready to lovingly confront them. And so he's using that tender term, beloved. I was on the uh, Skype yesterday with a gal in another country and I had to lovingly uh, speak to her about a situation. And I said, I'm saying this because I love you. And I didn't call her beloved, but I said, I'm saying this because I love you. and I hope it comes across as loving. And so I mentioned many times, one of the lady who's disciples me, she says, Susan, you should never love confrontation, uh, but when you do it, you need to do it with a white glove. And so we want to make sure that those that we're talking to and we are warning or admonishing that we do it in a spirit of meekness and love as the Bible tells us to. And it's also important at this point, he uses this word because not only that he's strongly admonishing them, but he's also confirming his love to them. I love you. You're my little children. So what is he lovingly admonishing them about? Notice what he says. I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you've heard from the beginning. Now, the word new here, when he says I'm writing, I write no new commandment unto you, the word new means new in kind or new in quality. John says, I'm not writing a new commandment unto you. I'm not telling you something that you haven't heard before. I'm writing to you about an old commandment that you already know about. The Greek word for old means antique, antique or not recent. And the commandment here is called old because they've heard it before. Um, now you might say, well, when did they hear this? What commandment is John talking about? Well, it's defined in the context, verses 9 through 11, the commandment is loving the brethren. Now, you might be scratching your head and say, well, wait a minute. When did they hear about this commandment? Where is this old commandment mentioned? Well, we've brought out before, John is writing to a Jewish audience, right? And most Jews, as mentioned, had memorized the first five books of Moses, especially if you were a male. So they would have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy memorized. Remember, most of them didn't have copy of the sacred scriptures. It was rare. It was too expensive. And so they had to memorize uh, a lost art in our culture. But nonetheless, uh, we probably should get back to it. But way back in Leviticus, so they would have this memorized. This is, not a old, this is not a new commandment to them. This is an old commandment. Leviticus 19.18 says this, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the children of your people. And then he says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? I am the Lord, Leviticus says. So John is saying, you've heard this before. You guys know this. You have it memorized. <laughs> You have it memorized. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, it's not an old commandment. Uh, the emphasis that John places on it, being new or novel, is important when he says, I don't write a new commandment unto you. Uh, that is important word because of what we've talked about before, the false teachers, uh, the Gnostic uh, false teachers that were coming in, and they were bringing in their new and novel ideas into the church, just like we have going on today in our churches. A uh, church looks more like a circus than a church. And so we have all these false teachers, even today, coming in, bringing all their new and novel ideas. And John says there's nothing new. 
there's nothing new. Like the Gnostic teachers, the heretic teachers are trying to teach you. Um, I don't know about you, but it baffles me that uh, we have all these new and novel and crazy ideas in the church today, and I'm like, I want to meet someone that's mastered these 66 books. And uh, then once you master these 66 books, then you can come and bring in something new and novel to me. No, you can't, but, but uh, I don't know of anyone that's mastered the 66 books in the sacred library. Have you? And I don't know why we're always looking for something new and novel when, I don't know, I don't know about you, I have not mastered the commandment to love the brethren, right? And I know you haven't either. Don't look so pious. So uh, you haven't mastered it either. Um, I don't know about you. I could spend the rest of my life until the Lord takes me home perfecting this commandment of loving the brethren. So John says this isn't new. This isn't new. Even though the Gnostics are trying to tell you and they want to bring in something new, this is no new commandment, but something you've heard from the beginning. Now, what does that mean, they heard it from the beginning? Well, it could mean two things. They heard it from the beginning of their conversion. Uh, they knew that from the time of their conversion. This was not a new idea or just the fact that, as I mentioned, most Jews had the Old Testament, the first five books of Moses, memorized. And so even though they might have not had genuine faith, they would at least know what the Old Commandment was, and that is to love the brethren. So what is the nature of the Old Commandment? Love the brethren. Well, John now turns to the nature of the New Commandment in verse 8. Here's the nature of the New Commandment. He says, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you. Now you might say, what happened to John here? Did he have a mental slip? I mean, didn't he just say in verse 7, he's not writing a new commandment? And now he says, I'm writing a new commandment. What's wrong with him? Uh, is he contradicting himself? No, he's not. Now ladies, we have to remember and we will better understand what John is saying if we'll look back at John 13. So turn back to John 13. Remember, John was sitting there with Jesus and the other disciples. Uh, Judas hadn't gone out yet to betray the Lord. They're all having their feet washed by Jesus. All 24 stinky, dirty feet are being washed by our Lord. And so Jesus comes after doing this act, this, this act of service, and he says in John 13, 34, look what he writes. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know you are my disciples, if you, love for, if you have love for one another. Now, ladies, Jesus knew what the Old Testament said. Jesus knew Leviticus 19. He knew about the Old Commandment, but even he himself is saying what? A new commandment. A new commandment. Why is this new? Well, because loving one another, it's not new in the sense that it hadn't been given yet, but it's new. It's fresh because of what? The new meaning that Jesus gives to it. By what? Dying to himself for others, laying down his life for others, being willing to wash their feet. Ladies, Christ gave it new meaning on earth. So in the New Testament, we as Christians are now motivated to love one another, not just because it's a commandment in the Old Testament that says, love your neighbor as yourself. Why? I'm the Lord. But now in the New Testament, we are commanded to love each other. Why? Because we've seen Christ model it. And not just by washing the disciples' feet, but soon after that, he goes to the cross and dies for our sins. And so we're motivated now to love each other, not just because it's a commandment, but it's new and fresh because Christ gave it new meaning by laying down his life. Ladies, as the Bible says, take up your cross daily and what? Live for yourself? No. Take up your cross daily and what? Die to yourself. Deny yourself. And by the way, as I mentioned, this is right after washing the disciples' feet. We love others because of our love for Christ. So the new commandment is fresh because notice what John says. It's true in him. It's true in who? Jesus Christ. It's true in him. He's genuine. He's reliable. John is saying, hey, guys, this commandment to love each other, it's true. It's reliable. It's the real thing. 
and model yourself after the Lord and do those things, that, those acts of service. In fact, later on in John 15, 12, while they're still in the upper room, Jesus says it again, this is my commandment that you love one another. How? As I have loved you. It's, not inter it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say, this is my commandment that you love one another as mentioned in Leviticus 19. He doesn't say that. This is my commandment that you love one another, what? As I have loved you you as I've expressed that love to you. So the commandment, John says, is in him and it is in us. This means what? We are to love the brethren just as Christ loved the brethren. Ladies, just as Christ died for us, we are to die daily for others. If you want to save your life, you'll lose it. If you want to lose your life, you'll save it, right? It's one of the things I was telling the gal yesterday. I was like, you know, the reason you're having so many problems is because you've isolated in yourself and your home. And uh, God has ordained you and saved you to love him and love others. And so this is why you're in the pit. And you need to get out of the pit, but you need to do it by what? Laying down your life for people. Get out and meet people and serve people and love people. And that's where true joy comes from. Ladies, we are to love as Christ's love. Well, John goes on to say this love that was in him is now in us also. And notice why. He says, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. What's he saying? He's saying darkness is how we used to live, right? For those of you that were in our Titus st study, we saw what? Before Christ, we were hateful. We were hating each other. Ladies, we were living in darkness. We were slaves to sin. We were living in darkness. But those of us who know the Lord, the darkness is past. That part is not who we are anymore. And, and Jesus says, or John says, the true light is now shining. In fact, we know that's why uh, Jesus sent Paul out to minister to the Gentiles. He says, open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God that they might receive inheritance among the saints. Jesus himself said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Ladies, Jesus is the true light in contrast to many false lights out there, which include the false teachers of our day. And in John's day, it would be the Gnostic teachers. And by the way, um, all false lights belong to Satan, right? Uh, all false teachers, all false teaching, uh, anyone that is involved in that is in darkness and belongs to Satan. Paul says it very clear in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and don't wonder about this, don't marvel about this, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light, <laughs> and so do his ministers. Uh, they're ministers of unrighteousness. But ladies, praise God, we as believers in Jesus Christ can claim 2 Corinthians 4, 6, which says, for it is God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness and has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We don't walk in darkness. We do not walk in darkness. So what is the nature of the new commandment? Love the brethren as Christ did. So John now continues with speaking of those who do not love their brother, but in fact they hate their brother Notice the nature of those who hate their brother in verse 9. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Now, remember we call these people the if we sayers. These are the Gnostic teachers and all who follow them. Remember, we've already seen, if you want to look back a little bit, we've already seen, uh, you know, they say in chapter 1, verse 6, they say, uh, oh, yeah, I have fellowship with him. I have fellowship with him. But they walk in darkness, and they lie and do not the truth. We've seen in chapter 1, verse 8, oh, I have no sin. <laughs> I have no sin. <laughs> what did John say? The truth isn't in you. You're a liar. Yeah, you have the nature of sin. We've already seen, uh, I know him. I know Jesus, but I don't keep his commandments. Remember what John said? You're a liar. You're a liar, and the truth is not in you. And we've seen in chapter 2, verse 6, they were saying what? Oh, I abide. <laughs> I abide in the light. 
Well, if you do, then you ought to walk as he walked. And so now they're saying what? They're saying they're in the light. I'm in the light. Hey, the darkness is past. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, but I hate you. <laughs> Makes no sense, right? I'm born again, but I don't like people. I remember one time Doug was discipling a certain man in our church. He's not here anymore, so. Uh, and, and Doug, this guy was full of pride, and Doug was trying to get to the root of the issue. And he goes, I'm trying to find out what. He said, well, I'm just better than everyone else, and I just don't like people. I mean, he actually told that to Doug. I won't tell you what Doug said, but uh, he didn't stay in our church very long. He said, I'm better than everyone else. And he said, and I know I am, and I just don't love people. Well, my friend, you can't say you're a Christian and not love people. You can't say you're in the light when you hate your brother. In fact, the word hate here means to detest or abhor. And the present tense in the Greek indicates a continuous attitude of hatred. Not a momentary hatred. We all have those moments, right? Don't look so pious. <laughs> Even my husband said, Marriage is a love-hate relationship. I mean, sometimes you love them so much, you want to squeeze them to death, and sometimes you want to squeeze them to death for another reason. But <laughs> it's a love But that's not what John's talking about. He's talking about an ongoing attitude of hatred or detesting someone. Do you know even John had moments of hatred? Um, remember when James and John... Uh, we're with Jesus, and, and they were going to get ready to go into the Samaritan village, and the Samaritan village said, nah, <laughs> we don't want Jesus here. Remember what James and John said? Master, why don't you call fire down from heaven and just blast this Samaritan village out of existence? Just kill them. And remember what Jesus said? You don't know what manner of spirit you are. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy lives, but to save them. And so even John had a moment of temporary hatred. He's like, you're not going to receive my master. We'll just obliterate you. We'll just kill you. And ladies, we all have times of that, right? We all have times where we forget what spirit uh, we should have, what, that we are daughters of the king. But our lives should be one of loving people. Uh, the false teachers that were in per 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 permeating the churches then, uh, they were claiming to be in the light. And yet we brought out, especially in our first lesson, they were looking down on everyone else. They had a superior knowledge. They had a hotline to heaven. They were in the know. And so they were looking down at other people in the church saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm better than you are. I know more than you do. And John's saying, no, no. You cannot claim to be in the light and look down on your brothers and sisters and think you're better than them. If you hate your brother, he says, you're not in the light. You're in the darkness. In fact, notice what he says. He says, you are in darkness until now. What does that mean? It means you are in darkness up into up into this moment, and you've always been in darkness. There has never been a moment of light. Ladies, the person who has an ongoing attitude of hatred towards others is in darkness right up to this moment, and he has never been in any other condition but darkness. In fact, we're going to see later on in 1 John, John says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and no murder has eternal life abiding in him. That's pretty clear, right? So if you have an ongoing attitude of hatred towards someone, a brother or sister in Christ, John says you're a murderer, and you have no eternal life. There's not a lot of wiggle room there, right? That's what I like about John. There's no wiggle room. Like, like, John, what are you trying to say? It's pretty clear, right? Maybe a good rule for all of us would be what Booker T. Washington once said. He said this, I am determined to permit no man to narrow or degrade my soul by making me hate him. And ladies, we have to remember, too, what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, uh, You've heard it said of all, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of hellfire. So we even have to watch those attitudes that come in our hearts, which can happen often, right? And where we have momentary attitudes of hatred or anger. So what is the nature of those who hate their brother? They are in darkness. So in contrast to those who hate their brother, we have those who love their brother in verse 10. Notice what John says the nature of those who love their brother. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in him. 
Now, did you notice something about verse 10? Interesting compared to all the other ones that we've looked at. Worthy of noting here in case you didn't see it. John doesn't say if we say. You know, a genuine Christian doesn't say that, do they? A genuine Christian doesn't go around boasting. Hey, hey, I do this. I love my brother. I, I, he doesn't do that. He doesn't praise himself. He doesn't pat himself on the back. Love, he loves in action, not with his mouth. In fact, he goes through life as Jesus did, not letting his left hand know what his right hand is even doing. But the if we sayers, the false teachers, the Gnostics, they were going around boasting. Hey, I'm in the light. Hey, I walk as he walked. Hey, I do this. Hey, I do that. Ladies, we have to be careful, right? We are not to go around boasting about those things. They were like the ones in the, in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, you know, the Pharisees, the, what they do before they, uh, you know, even give their tithe and their offering, he said they toot this horn. It's not a literal horn, but uh, they make all this money that when their money goes in the, this container that they would have, the more money they put in, the more noise it would make. And so it sounded like a trumpet. And so he'd say, you know, they do this so everybody can see them. You know, they want everyone to see what they're doing or they pray in the streets where the most traffic is, where the traffic Traffic meets in the corner, and they pray in the corner of the streets. Why? So everyone can see that they're religious. And Jesus says, don't do that. When you do something, you go and you do it in secret, right? You don't do it where everybody knows it. Well, that's what John is saying here. People that are truly in the light, they don't go around saying, hey, man, I love my brother. You know what I did this week for, you know, I was in a church one time. Debbie and I were, she'll remember this, and, and uh, it was kind of very uncomfortable. They asked us to come early for their Friday night whatever, and all the ladies just started popping up and giving testimony about all their good works for the week. And Debbie and I were like, do you remember that? And I was like, okay, well, uh, waiting for lightning to come down from heaven and strike them. And it, it just felt so unchristlike, you know, that we would go around boasting about what we are doing. And so it's worthy to note here. He doesn't say he who says he loves his brother. People that love their brother just do it, right? They're not looking for any praise. They're not looking for any glory. They're not looking for any reward. A genuine Christian doesn't say, I love my brother. He just shows it by his actions. He's not like the false teachers of his day. Now, to love our brother does not mean we have a warm, fuzzy affection for all believers. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard, you know, to have that warm, fuzzy affection for some believers. But... Um, to live with the saints above, that will be glory, but to live with the saints below, that's another story. So, you know, sometimes it's not that easy. But it does mean our attitude towards believers will be one of looking out for their interest above our own. We won't ignore them. We won't despise them. In fact, the word that John uses for love is agape. So it's not, a, it's not phileo, it's not an affection that we have as, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, it's not a feeling you have about another person, but agape love is different. And we're commanded to agape. You don't have to phileo me, you may not like me at all, and that's okay. Um, phileo, but you do have to agape me. Agape means to make a choice about another person, to meet a need, a legitimate need, not a want, a legitimate need that that person might have. Like Jesus, uh, when he died on the cross for our sins, why did he do that? Because you had a need. What's your need? You need a Savior, right? If you don't have a Savior, you're going to go into an eternal lake of fire. Um, ladies, it's like the story we see in Luke chapter 10. Remember in Luke chapter 10 when uh, somebody comes to Jesus and says, hey, who's my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And remember what Jesus said? He t gives the the story, the illustration of a man that's just, uh, he's traveling, he's walking, and remember he's uh, beaten up by thieves and he's robbed and he's left for half dead. And uh, remember the, the shocking thing is you have a Levite that comes by, the religious leader, the Levite. He comes by, he sees this man laying there half dead and he kind of walks around him. He don't want anything to do with him. And then you have a priest come by on the other side and he looks at him and he goes, oh, I don't, I'm not getting involved in that mess. So he walks on the other side. And then you have this despised Samaritan that's walking down, and he sees the guy, and he has compassion. And he pours oil and wine into the wounds. And then he, he goes, he takes him to the innkeeper, and he says, hey, I'm still walking on my journey. The average traveler would walk about 20 miles a day. And he said, I'm still on my journey. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to leave you some money. And would you take care of this man? And then he goes, and he takes his journey. He said, hey, when I come back, if you need more, 
I will give you more money. Take care of this man. Ladies, that's legitimate, that's legitimate agape love. This man had a need. He was going to probably die without somebody stopping to help him. And the despicable thing, it was two religious leaders that looked at him and just ignored him and walked on by. And yet the Jew, the Samaritan, who is a despised race, he's the one that stopped and took care of this guy. That's what John is saying. That's what love does. It meets the needs of someone else. And he certainly put the religious guys to shame. John's going to say later on in his epistle, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother has a need and shuts up his heart of compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? In other words, it doesn't. It doesn't. So, ladies, if we see someone in our group of people or our circle of friends that has a legitimate need, not a want, like a new iPhone, new car, they don't need that. That's a want. But a legitimate need, and we know we can meet it, and we don't meet it, John says, how dwells the love of God in you? Don't say you're walking in the light when you're not meeting the needs. In fact, he'll go on to say, my little children, don't love in word and tongue. Don't have mouth mercy. But what? Love in deed and in truth. Do something about it. Well, John uses the present tense for love here just as he did for hate. In other words, our love is not a sporadic moment of love that we have towards the brother, but it should be ongoing. Uh, today I get up and, you know, we hopefully show acts of love to one another, but I don't wake up tomorrow morning and Deb and I have to catch a flight at 537 in the morning, so I hope I wake up in the morning. But uh, I don't wake up in the morning and say, well, you know, I'm kind of tired, I much sleep, so I don't think I'll show love to anybody today. But, you know, it's going to be exciting, first flight without a mask. How to do you? Praise the Lord. I'm so excited about that. So, uh, you know, they'll see my smiling face. But I don't just wake up one day and say, okay, I'm not going to show love today. I, I showed love yesterday. Till today, it's all about me. That's not the, uh, the, what John is saying here. It's ongoing, always looking for ways to love the brethren. So John says, those who love abide in the light, which means they're staying in a permanent residence rather than a temporary stay. You are abiding in the light. John also says the person who loves their brother not only abides in the light, but there's no cause for stumbling in him. Now, this is interesting. He's not talking about causing other people to stumble. Romans 14 talks about that, that we're not to uh, do anything that would cause our brother to stumble. But here the stumbling is yourself. In fact, the word stumble means anything against which you strike or stumble. In fact, it refers to a person being deceived into thinking that what he is about to do is beneficial, just like, um, you know, a trap that is set for the animal, and they have, they think that what they're getting ready to do, eat that vittle, or eat that whatever it is that's in the trap, the cheese for the mice, or whatever, they think what they're getting ready to do is beneficial to them, right? I'm going to get something to eat. But then that animal falls into the trap, and what happens? Well, they're usually killed. But they stumble. So it is with a person. They may think he think they're doing well, but they've deceived themselves into thinking that what they are doing is beneficial when actually it leads them to being trapped. What's John saying? Ladies, loving others frees us, enables us to make progress in our spiritual walk, and keeps us from stumbling. When you have an attitude of hatred, unforgiveness, bitterness towards others, you can't progress in your spiritual walk. You can't progress. You're going to stay stuck. You're going to be like that animal that gets caught in the trap. You stumble and you fall. John Wesley says this, He that hates his brother is an occasion of stumbling to himself. He stumbles against himself and against all things within and without, while he that loves his brother has a free, disencumbered journey. Ladies, loving others is freeing. When you, when you withhold love, when you withhold things that you know that you can do for others, you're a stumbling block to yourself, <laughs> and it keeps you from growing in your Christian walk. Well, what is the nature of those who love their brother? They abide in the light, and they don't stumble. John finishes his thoughts now with going back to those who hate their brother, the nature of those who hate their brother. But he who hates his brothers in darkness, he walks in darkness, 
He does not know where he's going. Why? Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The word bud here is a word of contrast. In contrast to the lover of the brethren in verse 10, we have the hater of the brethren in verse 11. And John's already said, if you hate your brother, you're in darkness. And now he adds something. Not only are you in darkness, notice what he says, but you walk in darkness and darkness has blinded your eyes. Did you hear what he's saying? You're not just walking in darkness. That's a habit of life. But darkness has blinded your eyes. Blinded your eyes to what? The truth of the gospel. You think you're saved. But ladies, you're completely blind. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. You're blind. You can't see. Blinded here in 1 John is in the aorist tense in the Greek, which pictures the decisive moment when the darkness finally overtakes the sinner. Ladies, this is a sobering statement that John makes. This person fails to understand the destination they're headed for because darkness has blinded their eyes and they can't even see. <laughs> they think they're loving their brother. They think they're a Christian, like that man that my husband talked to. He would have said he was a Christian. Still does today, as far as I know, but he hates people. He hates people. How can we say that? We're in darkness, walking in dark. We've never known anything but darkness if we have attitudes like that. And darkness has blinded our eyes. We see a glimpse of this when Jesus pleads with an unbelieving crowd in John 12. He says, a little longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Ladies, walking in darkness is a sobering thought. Being blinded to the point you can't see is a sobering thought. Not only is this darkness for this life, but the life to come. As Jude describes hell as the blackness of darkness forever. That's an awful place, right? I remember asking my husband one time, I said, how could hell be a lake of fire, but also the blackness of darkness? He goes, I don't know, Susan. That's up to God, but uh, maybe you don't have eyes to see. Who knows? Maybe your eyes aren't, you don't have eyes in hell. But the blackness of darkness forever. Ladies, there will never be a trace of light in hell. So in summary, what's the nature of the old commandment? Love the brethren. What's the nature of the new commandment? Love the brethren like Christ did. What's the nature of those who hate their brother? They're in darkness. They walk in darkness. They don't know where they're going because darkness has blinded their eyes. What is the nature of those who love the brother? They abide in the light and they don't stumble. Ladies, our pews today are filled with people who claim to know Christ. They claim to walk in the light. But at the same time, they have hatred towards people even in their own congregation. That shouldn't be. My sisters, these things should not be. And so since Jesus says loving one another is the mark that others will know that we are his disciples, I would like to close by way of asking some questions based on that great chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. So do you really love the brethren? Are you patient with people, especially your husband and your children and those in your family? Love is patient. Are you kind to others? Does it show in your tone of voice and in your body language? Love is kind. Are you jealous of other people wanting what they have? Do you envy their position, their looks, or their material possessions? Love is never jealous or envious. Do you boast around others about how great you are or what you've accomplished? Do you secretly think you're better than others and judge people in your heart? Love is never boastful, never proud, never haughty. Do you always insist on your own way? Do you pout when you don't get your own way? Do you resent time or energy that you give to others? Love is never selfish. It does not demand its way. Do you cut people off in traffic? Do you treat your children or husband as second-class citizens? Are you abrupt on the phone with others? Love is not rude. Are you agitated and frustrated with others or circumstances that God allows? Do other people know it's that time of the month by your behavior? 
Love is not irritable or touchy. When someone hurts your feelings, do you bring it up to them? Do you remember all the mistakes your husband has made? Love does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. Do you secretly or even openly gloat when an enemy of yours gets their due? Do you rejoice when others excel, especially in the things of Christ? Love is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Are you loyal to your marriage, to your children, to your friendships, to the leaders in your church? If you love someone, you'll be loyal to him, no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, expect the best of him, and always stand your ground defending him. In closing, the aged old apostle John, tradition tells us when he was about 100 years old and he was bidding farewell to his congregation before he died, he admonished them by saying, my little children love one another. My little children love one another. The audience said, John, give us a new commandment. We're tired of that old commandment. Give us a new commandment. John replied, brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you heard from the beginning. Love one another. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we pray that you would help us to really do heart surgery on ourselves. Lord, we know you're the great physician and you scan our secret thoughts. But Father, I pray that you would show us where we are falling short on loving people. And Lord, I pray that we would not be partial in our love, that we would not be accused of having holy cliques, that we would reach out to all, even those that are not like us. Pray that we would be known as women who love and that we would not stumble and, and be disencumbered in our journey because of hatred or unforgiveness in our hearts, Lord. So, Father, I, I just pray, I pray that you would help me, help every woman here this morning, Lord, to examine themselves in light of loving the brethren. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.